I am so excited I get to preach this morning for you. Yeah. <clears throat> And especially on the passage that's before us. I want to say, I just never want you to miss this. My wife and I just so admire Pastor Dave and Gretchen. We were first drawn to this church by hearing him preach. We love the vision you all have, the guts you have to do this together. I, I'm just so excited to be here. I've never been part of anything. I'm, a pastor. I'm 70 years old. I've been a pastor a long time. I've never seen anything quite like this, and it's just really exciting for us to be in it. And I'm very thankful that Dave, I would say, surrendered this great text to me. Let me pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we are not like other people. And we are not to think like other people or love what other people love. You have made us new from the inside out and set before us a life here and forever that is unattainable, unimaginable by those who don't know Jesus. So I pray for your grace and your help to me, for me today as I preach this extraordinary passage about the second coming of Christ. And for these brothers and sisters, all of us, in various times and ways, face death, the death of our loved ones. And so we need to know the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Incidentally, our slides aren't working today. My slides aren't working today. They were works of art. I just want you to know. They were amazing. Yes, they were amazing. And... Uh, it grieves me, but uh, this also means that you actually have to use a Bible instead of just reading it on the screen. Yeah, so your, your phone, which, you know, for us old people, it's just hard to believe you can call that a Bible. But whatever you use, you're going to need your Bible this morning. And um, the uh, text of this sermon, almost verbatim, is available, uh, I forget, Dave, is it on the website or where do they? Website. On the church website. And I think there might be copies in the back as well. And then I'm selling them next to the 8x10 the glossies, which I have signed, if you would like to have them autographed. <laughs> they're really cheap. Yeah, they're really cheap. <clears throat> in my role as a pastor, I've been with people as they approach death or as they grieve those who have died. And I can tell you that there's no comparison between those who die in Christ and those who don't. It isn't really that those who don't have no hope. We know they don't, but they don't know they don't. They think that they're going to become angels with the Lord in heaven, that they're going to play golf forever or eat at chocolates or something. They have these crazy ideas. They don't really think they're in danger. They don't really think they're hopeless. But they don't have anything to stand on. So today we're going to look at something to stand on. C.S. Lewis said, at present we're on the outside of the world. The wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of morning, but they don't make us fresh and pure. We cannot mingle with the splendors we see, but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. The New Testament ends, Come, Lord Jesus. Repeat it with me. Come, Lord Jesus. I'd like you to turn in your Bible as we continue in Thessalonians to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. 
Christians are meant to be restless people. Like battle-weary soldiers waiting for the flight home. Like a bride a week before her wedding. Restless people. Paul wrote here in this chapter, verse 13, Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. One of the most encouraging bedrock truths every Christian must know and understand is this. Jesus is coming back for all who trust him, whether we live or whether we sleep. Jesus is coming back. Do you know that there are over 300 verses in the New Testament about the second coming of Christ? But no passage tells us more in one place than this little short passage. That's why it's such a treat to look at it. It just blows my mind. It's the, to imagine what is told us here is extraordinary. I want to just show you in this passage two great reasons for encouragement. It ends, therefore encourage each other with these words. So, here's the words. Two reasons. The first is, be encouraged because no believer, no believer will miss Jesus' return. Now, for us, all these centuries removed from uh, this letter, we know that as Christians. But they didn't know that. Those believers, they were afraid that if somebody in their church died before Jesus came back, well, they'd be lost. Because they thought Jesus was coming right back. Right back. And so when people started to die in their congregation, they didn't know what to think. So this is written for them to say, don't, don't worry about that. Now, we don't have their fear, but we profit from these uh, things that we're told. Look at verse 14. For we believe, this is the bedrock, this is where we get our theology. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so, we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. That's the essential center of this little passage. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so, because of that, we believe that Jesus is going to come back for those who trust him. There are people, like I said, who have some kind of hope, or others, like someone I talked to recently, who think that after we die, there's just nothing. And if I say, well, I don't believe that, say, they'll say, well, you have your beliefs and I have mine. I think, yeah, but I have evidence. I have a fact. Jesus died and rose again, and that's why I believe that I have hope. Look at something closely here. It says uh, in verse 14 that Jesus died. See it here? Um, we believe that Jesus died... And then he says, those who, he will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. Not the same. Now, I know we speak of Christians dying. I understand. It's the way we speak. But to put a fine point on it, we don't die. We fall asleep. Harold J. Ockengay said, death is the God-forsaken experience of a condemned soul. Death is the God-forsaken experience of a condemned soul. This is the death of Jesus. Jesus died in the fullest and most horrible sense of the word, the God-forsaken experience of a condemned soul. When we put our faith in Jesus, God puts us in Christ on that cross. And in him, we have already died the God-forsaken experience of the condemned soul. It's all done. It's over with. 
never to come again. His death swallows up our death. Verse 17 speaks of the dead in Christ. Same idea. The dead in Christ. That's us. Our condemnation is in him on the cross. And when God raised him from the dead, death's sting was gone for us. And sin's sentence was paid by him on our behalf. So when our bodies give out, we don't really die. It's okay if you want to say it that way. Nobody's going to be misunderstand. But we really just fall asleep. Alexander McLaren, over 100 years ago, said, His death makes our deaths sleep. And his resurrection makes our sleep calmly certain of waking. And where are those who have fallen asleep? I remember sitting with a grieving daughter. She says, where's my daddy right now? Well, there's a lot we're not told. And I don't want to go further than I have authorization to go. I don't understand all of this, but I can tell you some things. It says here in, the, in our text, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Which tells me they're with Jesus now. If you just look over into the next chapter in verse 10, chapter 5, verse 10, it says, He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may, what? Live together with him. Jesus said to the repentant thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. Paul wrote that he would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are living with Christ as surely as we who are awake are, more surely. And when Jesus comes, they will come with him. D.L. Moody, who, the founder of Moody Bible Institute, he had a famous statement. I remember one Sunday morning getting up in our church in uh, Lincolnshire, and one of the guys had put this on my pulpit to, to see before I got up to preach. A, a brother who died, and whose funeral I preached, and whose daughter said, is my daddy with me? D.L. Moody said, one day you will hear that D.L. Moody of Northfield, Massachusetts is dead. Don't you believe it? In that day, I will be more alive than I have ever been before. When Christians die, the passage is no more traumatic than falling asleep and waking up. The next moment, we are awake in Jesus' presence. Our bodies, however, continue to sleep, for lack of a better word. Believers' bodies are like incubating. Uh, they're dormant, like the lily bulbs right now in our gardens. But the spirits of those who have fallen asleep are alert and enjoying the company of the Lord at this moment. God will see to it. This is the point here. God will see to it that those who have fallen asleep in Christ will not miss out on Jesus' second coming. In fact, they get first dibs. They get to go to the front of the line. They go first, verse 15. According to the Lord's word, that means, I got this from Jesus himself. That's what he means here. We tell you that we who are still alive... Who are, who are left until the coming of the Lord, maybe us, maybe not, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. So, what will the coming of the Lord be like? The Bible doesn't tell us everything we'd like to know, but it tells us everything we need to know 
in order to be encouraged. So verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ, they'll rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words, which is just what I intend to do right now. (laughs) Be encouraged, secondly, in knowing what will happen when Jesus comes back. It says, to begin with, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. When Jesus ascended into the heavens, surrounded by his disciples, on the Mount of Olives, the angels told the watching disciples in Acts 1.11, this same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. How did he go in to heaven? He rose into the sky and was taken up into a cloud. How's he going to come back? In the clouds and then appearing to his disciples. At the signal of the Father, at the time no one knows, the Lord Jesus Christ will rise from his sapphire throne and pass through the arches of glory, past the altar of sacrifice, stained with his own blood shed for sinners, past the altar of incense, where are gathered all the fragrant pleading prayers of the saints, past the awesome, indescribable living creatures who surround and, the, and guard the throne of God. And summoning a great archangel and, the, and rallying the hosts of all angels to accompany him. He will cross once again the great gulf fixed between heaven and earth and step through the curtain of the sky. There will be no need for a shepherd, for a star to point him out this time. There will be no need for shepherds or wise men to spread the word this time. There will be no need for signals of a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes this time. This time there will be no missing his coming. It says he will come with a loud command. What's he going to say? Right? What's he going to say? I don't know, but you know when he raised Lazarus from the dead, do you remember that story in John 11? He stood at the tomb, and you remember what he said? He said, Lazarus, come out! And somebody has said, if he didn't name Lazarus, all the tombs in the world might have become open. Right? So maybe this time, when he appears, he will say, Beloved, come out! (laughs) He says he will come with the voice of the archangel. Again, we don't know what he says, but we know about archangels. There's a couple of them mentioned specifically, Gabriel and Michael in the Bible. It must be one of them. Whoever he is, he has stood guard over God's people for centuries. He has engaged in hand-to-hand combat with Satan himself for us. He has stood ready, always at the throne of God for the wishes of God. And now, 
He comes with Christ, ready to add his voice to the command of the Lord, like a great amen. Jesus said, not in this text, but elsewhere, that when he came, he would return with his holy angels. So it is not only the archangel, it's the heavenly host, breaking through once more as they did at his birth, into the blue sky of our world, following Jesus himself, the triumph, and the archangel, and these great shouts. Wow, what's it going to be like? And he will come with the trumpet call of God. God has been kind of preparing us for this. When he appeared to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai, there was a trumpet call, not human, that summoned them trembling to the foot of Mount Sinai. We don't want to go any further. God commanded them that when they prepared to celebrate their feast of forgiveness, the Passover, that a trumpet should be sounded. When they prepared to go into the promised land for the first time, there was a kind of reveille. They were told to have two hammered silver trumpets to sort of wake them up and get them going into their promised land. You see it? And for when, whenever the Israelites went into battle or had a reason for rejoicing, there was trumpets. And at the, at the dedication of Solomon's great temple, the Bible says there were 120 priests with ram's horns. You heard those things? They don't like play taps or something. They go, like that. 120 of them. Those were prophecies. They were all muted prophecies of the trumpet call of God. Then it says, the dead in Christ will rise first. We've talked about that. Our fellow believers who have been with the Lord will now experience the resurrection of their bodies. We have all heard, maybe even said, this thing that so-and-so has died and now angel, uh, God, uh, heaven has gained another angel. That's baloney. That's, there's nothing, that's not true. Because the believers in Jesus are the population of heaven in new bodies. They have been with the Lord, but they have not been complete. Their bodies have been laying asleep till this moment. I can't imagine how this works. I've tried, believe me. I've sat and tried to work this out. The bodies, our bodies, the bodies of the dead are scattered across the earth in graves, in the sea, in ashes and dust. But somehow the Lord God will summon from those bodies, from those remnants, those leftovers, those seeds, the makings of new bodies for the saints. We don't get just a whole new body. It's this body made right, made new, recreated. As different as an acorn is from an oak, as a seed from a rose. That's what's going to happen. And it starts with those who are dead in Christ, but it doesn't stop there. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds. The Latin word for caught up is rapto. And that's where we get rapture. This is the rapture. That's what we call it. It's the seizing. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, Jesus tells a story. One will be working uh, in a, you know, at, the, at the well, and the other one will be there, and bam, one is gone. 
bam, bam, just seized up. No time to prepare, no time to say goodbye, no time for regrets. Bam, just gone. And there we will be with those who have been dead in Christ, all of us rising to meet the Lord somehow, like this great exultant crowd coming to their champion. Part of the reason this rapture is so wonderful when you think about it is, that, is all that will be left behind. All that drags us down here. All that weighs us. The heavy gravity that pulls tears from our eyes and forces our bodies to bend beneath the weight of sin and sorrow. We will be caught up away from the crippling memories and sorrows, from habits that have hobbled us and weaknesses that have hindered us, all thrown off like sandbags cut away from a fast-rising hot air balloon. Like our brothers and sisters who already are asleep, those who are alive are still alive when Jesus comes, will receive new bodies, all of us. What makes these new bodies so glorious? Well, it's not really that we become superheroes, x-ray vision, <laughs> superhuman strength, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. I don't know, maybe we will. Who? I don't know. That's just not the point. Those things pale in significance to the fact that these bodies then will be sin-free and sick-free. That these bodies will be fit for eternal living. These minds will no longer be muddled by the lies and the lunacy of this world so confuses us. These eyes, which then will be able to bear the brilliant sights of heaven without going blind. These ears will be refitted so that we can hear all the octaves of all the songs of saints and angels. These lips, these tongues will be changed so that they can never again hurt and can only speak praise and truth forever. And these hearts will be clean enough and big enough and loving enough to embrace the glory of God. We will be fit for a new world, free from sin, a whole civilization of people who are like Jesus, through and through. Johnny Erickson Tata, paralyzed now over 50 years, said, don't assume that all I ever do is dream about springing out of this wheelchair, jumping up, dancing, kicking, doing aerobics. No, I'm looking forward to heaven because of a new heart. A heart free from sin, sorrow, and selfishness. That beats having a new body any day. And it says, we shall be together with them in the clouds. Whoa. Hi, Johnny. All right. This happens just at the point where I have no more slides. I had about 20 this far, and now we have none for most of the rest of this sermon. But, oh, they were good. They were good. Okay, so it says here that we shall be together with them in the clouds. What a reunion. 
Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, 31, that his angels will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Oh, 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 wow. You know, God's people have never all been together at one time. We have all shared testimonies with one another and heard the testimonies of saints long before us. But we have never all been together. We have confessed one Lord, one faith, one baptism for 2,000 years. We have eaten at the same table, but we have never all been together. We have sung the same songs or variations of them. We have prayed the same kinds of prayers. We have read the same scriptures. But we have never all been together. Each of us, in our own time and place across the ages, has affirmed again and again, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we have never all been together. We have sensed as believers, deep within, that we are part of one great church across the ages and miles and languages. And finally, on that great day, we will all be together when we meet the Lord in the air. And look, we meet in the clouds, it says, in the air. Imagine this. Imagine this. You step out today when you leave and you just look up and imagine this. You know, in the Bible, the air has been the domain of Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air. He has tormented us and lied to us and accused us and sought by every means to destroy us. But he will be cast down and we will meet in triumph where once he reigned. And it will be the Lord Jesus' domain, the place of our reunion. And it says we shall meet the Lord, the Lord in the air. And so we will be with him forever. We can imagine perhaps a shadow of the joy of reunion with those we know and love. And we try. And well, we might. But I don't think our minds can conceive or our hearts imagine what it will be like to meet the Lord in the air. He who died for us. He who knows your name. He to whom we have prayed. How many times? Dear Jesus. And son, just like this morning. The beloved Lord who has always been near us, but never seen. Our image of him has always necessarily been sort of earthbound. Sandals and robe. Cross fixed. Or standing outside the gaping mouth of an empty tomb. But in that moment, we shall see him in his glory. Eyes blazing, his face shining like the sun in all its brilliance. The angels shall be around him, adding to the spectacle and the glory, the splendor of that, these bright, shining angels, but adding most of all to the glory of Jesus will be you and me and all the saints because we are the trophies of his grace. 
We are the beloved for whom he died and rose again. No one is more precious to him, none, none of the angels of heaven, than you are and I am, we as the people of God, when he brings us to meet him in the air. When we do, there are some other things that will drop behind. You know, when we rise to meet the Lord, we won't need to bring our Bibles for the first time. Seems sad, right? I love my Bible, but no need. Leave it behind. Because when we see him, we will know. The, the dark glass that has clouded our vision of what we are and where we're going will, will be wiped clean, taken away. And faith, you won't need faith anymore. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. Well, everything will be seen. Never need faith again. All will be sight. Finally, when we rise to meet the Lord in the air, don't miss this. He comes to meet us. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he told his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back. This is bridegroom talk. Honey, honey, I'm preparing a place. I'm meeting with a young couple right now. They're going to get married in June. They're, they're working on their house. Getting the carpet this week, the countertops this week. Honey, I'm preparing a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. Jesus is our bridegroom. And no bridegroom ever gave more to win his beloved than Jesus. No bridegroom has ever waited longer for his bride than Jesus. Nor with such happy anticipation as Jesus. That day is not really just about victory over enemies. It's about a wedding. Jesus has been waiting to be reunited with us, whom he loves passionately. No one is more excited about that airborne assembly of saints who meet the Lord than the Lord Jesus himself. This dying world, this world has a sort of pallor, a death pallor upon it, upon our culture, upon all the things we think are funny or beautiful even. There's a pallor on it. People around us have no clue about life. They die without Jesus. And whatever they think will happen is not true. You don't get to kind of pick your path. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. This is our treasure, our privilege, our hope, and it is why we endure and persevere. So, brothers and sisters, encourage each other with these words. Isn't that a great picture? It's by Ron DeCiani. I love that picture. Phil Yancey, in one of his books, tells about someone he's met whose grandmother lies buried beneath 150-year-old live oak trees in southern uh, Louisiana. And there's one, one word on her tombstone. Waiting. It's powerful. I want to share with you a story to encourage you. My friend uh, Gary Malam <clears throat> battled cancer 
and he battled cancer uh, a number of years ago. And because of that wrestling and overcoming, and God's grace to him, it gave him uh, a number more years. And in those years, um, in Gary, there was a, um, what's the word? An enhanced grace of God. An enhanced uh, commitment to his Lord. An enhanced um, communication with his family. Those, were, those years were a gift to Gary and a gift to us. One day while Gary was at work, um, I think Teresa, who was right here, got a call that he was having a hard time walking, and he ran into a pole. And um, that wasn't a good day. <laughs> and so he went home, and then he got checked out, and the report that no one wants to hear is that the cancer had returned. Didn't know how um, bad it was. Come to find out, it was, it was pretty bad. <clears throat> and so Gary uh, courageously, lovingly said, okay, we're going to go. We're going to do it, right? And so he returned to the doctors and the medical professionals to do what they could for his cancel. And he battled. We had a number of really, really uh, significant conversations. And in those conversations, we talked about heaven. In the conversations, we talked about how are you doing? Where are you at? And he was at peace. Now, we had hoped that uh, he would be here with us this day, just 62 years old. But I knew in his heart that he was, he was ready. And so as a diagnosis, some days were pretty good and other days not so good, but it became apparent that he needed to go back into the hospital. And it became apparent that his body uh, was shutting down. And so, just a few weeks ago, on February 9th, as he was in the hospital up in Madison in the uh, ICU unit, the family received a phone call, said, it's time to come up. And so, so they came. Sons came, family came, people came. That the time was close. <clears throat> I was grateful to be invited and to be allowed into the hospital with the family, which I was grateful for. And so, you know, you can imagine the scene, especially in the ICU. You know, there's lots of equipment. There's lots of stuff going on. Gary's in the bed. Um, he has a, a face mask on for oxygen. <clears throat> and um, it was a gift to spend that time with him. And so we talked, looking me dead in the eyes, right? And he wanted a different mask. They gave him a, another mask so he could speak clearer. Right? He wasn't on any pain meds at that point. He wasn't, you know, he was completely lucid. It wasn't, it wasn't that. He was there. He was communicating. His mind was functioning quite well while his body was failing. And I reassured him about the grace of God. Reassured him about the love of Jesus. Reassured him of what was to be there. And we read scripture together. We prayed. And that peace that surpasses all understanding was present. And then something um, remarkable happened during the next few, few hours. <clears throat> And I've read about this, but I've never been present when, when someone was experiencing this. And so Gary is not one who is prone to seeing visions or hearing voices or being that way. He's just a steady, blue-collar, working man who loved Christ, who loved his family. Right? And as Gary was laying there, and the first time Teresa was on his side, I was just down the, just right next to her. <laughs> Gary asked us a question. He's like, do you hear that music? And we're like, I don't hear any music. You know? And then a little bit later, you know, Gary picks up the, the nurse call button, you know what I'm saying, where they have it connected to TV, you know, where you hit the things. You know, it's sent across his lap. You, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? So he, he picks it up and he starts, he puts it to his, puts it to his ear. He's like, 
Where's that music coming from? And then Teresa rightly said, well, Gary, what do you hear? And then Gary said these words. He looked and he says, clear the way. Let's celebrate. And he says, it's the most beautiful music I've ever heard. And a little bit longer, you know, and I started, man, I better start taking notes here, right? (laughs) And a little bit later, you know, he's there, we're talking, and then he hears another line. Hail the grace of God. So they're singing, hail the grace of God. And a little later, a little later, here's Gary again sitting there, right? And he says, gives us another lyric. You are a glorious God. And there was a holiness to that moment that I've rarely experienced. It's like God's presence was there. It was like a thin place between heaven and earth. You know, the best way I can put it, I don't know. And here is someone here who's this close. Hearing these words. And then a little later, (laughs) celebrate. Hallelujah, a new day has come. He's hearing these words and telling us. A little later, one more line. I love this line. There is a future in the love of the Lord. Just let that sink in. There's a future in the love of the Lord. He also said, praise his name. And he described that there's just praise everywhere. And the congregation singing the name of our God. And here's one that was just at the doorstep of entering into that next dimension. Like Lee was saying about falling asleep and then waking up. God gave Gary that gift. And it was for Gary, but it wasn't about Gary. Now, he could have heard this music on his own and not being able to communicate. But he could communicate clearly, lucidly, right? And then we have these words, and his family heard those words. There's more. It's true. It's glorious. There is a future in the love of the Lord. Hail the grace of God. Those three hours for me was a gift of God. It's moments that I will never forget. And at one point, I I told Teresa, I said, you know what? I think it's going to happen that he's going to. And he heard it. He says, can we turn it up? He would say that a number of times. Can can they just turn it up? (laughs) I imagine over the next less than 24 hours, that degree, degree, that music was turned up. Until he was present singing, Hail the grace of God. When he went home. I want you to be encouraged by those words. It's a confirmation what we have from the word. Okay. It was a special gift to Gary. It was a special gift to me. As a special gift to the family. And for this young man right in the front row, which we baptized a couple weeks ago, right? We'll have him share that story at some point. His wife, Katie, and he'll tell his story about God uh, speaking to him. 
he went from not believing to God's good, incredible grace. Right. New life out of a difficult moment. Right. And so I'm looking forward to seeing Gary again. I'm looking forward to seeing all those who are in the Lord again. And at Gary's funeral, um, Rob put, to, put these words to music, and I'm grateful that he did that. He wrote a song based on those lyrics. And we're going to end this service with that song. I'm going to come up, and I'm going to read some, some more, and we'll pray. And so I want you to hear the words, but I also want you to sing the words. And we don't know what the melody was, okay? But it's beautiful, and it's a reminder for us to be encouraged. Right? The day is coming, what Jesus said it was true, what is written, we can trust. You can be assured. God keeps his promises, and behold the grace of God. So why don't we sing this song? You are the glorious, you are the 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Yeah, that's beautiful, isn't it? I'm going to read one passage for us. Okay. It's found in the book of Revelation, describing what is yet to come. Again, I want these words to soak into the soil of your soul. Okay. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold! The dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. I want you to be encouraged from what is yet to come. This is what we have to look forward to. Because of the grace of God. So celebrate. Hail. Here's a future in the love of the Lord. And if you are here today and you are in the faith, be encouraged. Right? Encourage one another with these things. And if you are listening and if you are here, they're like, well, I'm not sure. I know about Christ, but I don't know Christ. I want to talk to you this morning. Today is your day for salvation. I'm going to pray and when I dismiss as people are going, I want you to come right here. And we'll deal with that today. Introduce you today. We're doing another baptism at four. We'll put you on the docket. Okay. If you're online, just send us a note in the chat room. Seriously, we'll, we'll get a hold of you. So let's pray. Hmm. God, you didn't have to tell us what is yet to come. And yet you did. You gave to us in wonderful details that you are going to make all things new. That the dead in Christ will rise first. And that you will be true to your promises. You redeemed your bride. You declared your kingdom. And Father, I ask that the reality of heaven will impact the stuff of earth. That the hope of your love and your future and your return will grow brightly in our hearts. That you, Jesus, have prepared the way. 
And we say with the Apostle John, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Shine in us, redeem this world. We praise you, for you are glorious. We thank you for the hope that we have based on the promise that you've given of the salvation that we have. And we'll see you in its glory. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away. You are glorious. You are a great hope, our sure reward. May those who are in darkness see the great light of Christ. We thank you that our eternity is secured because of your grace. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.